welcome everyone to the KSOC Customer Spotlight. Uh, we really appreciate you all being here. We're going to try to avoid some, some dead air time and just get started with introductions. Uh, we are here with uh, a few folks from a company called Invoca. I'll let them kind of tell you what Invoca is, how they're building on top of Kubernetes. But um, yeah, we are happy to have you all here. And just so you know, we have the webinar chat going. Um, if you have any questions, comments, remarks, uh, please go for it. And we will address them on the fly. Um, and let's get going. So uh, my name is Jimmy. I'm the co-founder and CTO here at KSOC. Uh, we have a platform uh, built to help discover, remediate, uh, and observe security issues across big, large, multi-cluster environments like we're going to talk about today at Invoca. And uh, we are here with Esty and Matt. They are both security engineers at Invoca, uh, working on various parts of the stack. But we're really thankful to have them here to kind of discuss uh, their Kubernetes journey, which is an interesting one. Uh, if you signed up for the webinar, you saw that uh, Invoca has been using uh, Kubernetes as a, a compute platform for a long time, 2016 into 2017, which is, uh, uh, if I remember correctly, pre probably pre 1.0 of the Kubernetes uh, release, which is before a lot of <laughs> features that we have today. So we'll we'll touch on how they're using Kubernetes uh, to scale uh, a, a, a telephony stack, if you will. There's more to it than that, but that's a really interesting use case. So um, without further ado, I think we will uh, just dive right in. So um, the first thing we're going to talk about is uh, an interesting one to lead with, uh, and that's that's values that exist at your company. Uh, we were kind of prepping for this, and a few interesting tidbits came out of the conversation in that Invoca has some some pretty well documented, well adhered to, and 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 kind of uh, progressive values as an engineering and, and uh, organization that I think are worth talking about because they kind of match the Kubernetes and container um, uh, kind of shift left patterns that we like to talk about. And uh, you know, if we could start there, and then we can lead into like why the heck we're even using Kubernetes in the first place and why you would stick with this thing for so long. So I'll pass it over to SD uh, to talk about the engineering values that Invoca has set forth. Okay, hi, so I'm SD, like uh, Jimmy mentioned before. Uh, so I just wanna talk a little bit about Invoca values. Um, one basic like engineering principle that we have is uh, elimination of waste enables efficiency, which basically means that we want to measure twice, cut once. We don't want to repeat ourselves. Um, another big value that we have at Invoca is that the most effective people to uh, the work, the, the most effective people to design and build systems are the people that are closest to the work. Um, and we really want to empower the engineers uh, on teams to create and their own design proposals. We want them to create the infrastructure for their own services and make that as easy as possible for them to do. Um, we another another uh, aspect that we have is the we want to enable easy ease of like auditing systems um and finding vulnerabilities so we should only have the complexity necessary to solve the problem like we don't want to add a lot of complexity we we like to start off with like mvps for every single problem that we have um and this idea of um and of creating MVPs to solve problems and reiterating continuous reiteration and improvement. All of these values that I talked about are kind of some factors of why we chose Kubernetes in the first place as our infrastructure. A lot of other companies are getting onto the bandwagon right now. Um, you know, I was mentioning to Jimmy last week how I, I was at a Forrester conference and the keynote was uh, urging everyone in the audience to get on the cloud. 
And they said, you know, like if you can't move all of your infrastructure to the cloud, maybe move half of it, or you can have a little bit of a hybrid model. For Invoca, we moved to the cloud uh, in 2016, which is pretty early adoption. And we did that because of the principles that we have. Yeah, it, it, that's that's a, a really interesting way to lead this conversation off. Um, we hear a lot about DevOps, and I'll pass it over to you in a second, Matt, if you have anything to add. But um, I think like the DevOps, we've all seen many talks around DevSecOps and shift left and these words that often don't have a lot of meaning at the end of the day. But I, I you know, from talking with you all, it sounds like Kubernetes actually is a little more than just a... a a, a buzzword or you you didn't pick it just because it was the hot thing to do because back then it wasn't actually the hot thing to do at all it was probably deemed as somewhat crazy uh because it was so new right so it's uh interesting to see those worlds collide where you have extreme ownership of a service from end to end which i think is the most powerful part of a container really as a packaging mechanism is that a developer can actually run that locally own that service and all the ancillary bits that that construct a pod or deployment uh, and within Kubernetes, carving out your own namespaces to actually experiment and like ship products faster, which, you know, you know, Kubernetes doesn't do that by itself. You actually have to have an organizational change. So uh, anything to add there, Matt, what's your experience been um, working at Invoca? I don't, I don't actually know how long you've been there, but is that kind of ownership, uh, helping you build out the security program? Absolutely. You know, actually, uh, as you touched on a lot of great points there, a lot of engineering uh, values discussed. And uh, we have four main company um, uh, values that can tether kind of into that, which really uh, brought us to the bleeding edge of, I would say, not even cutting edge, but bleeding edge of the technology that was incorporated at uh, Invoca. I started here in uh, 2021, May, and I can tell you that I've learned a lot since I've been here, um, more than pretty much any other place. And I absolutely love it. Um, everybody here does take service ownership incredibly seriously. Um, and part of the company values that help with that is uh, to figure it out. So one of the things that Invoca really uh, inspires their engineers to try things, fail, work with each other, uh, talk with one another, cooperate. Uh, and that's why we're able to do things like Kubernetes. We were into the cloud uh, in 2016, but um, to be able to take that risk and get into that, um, I was actually at a company called Di Dialogue Tech prior to uh, Invoca and Invoca had purchased Dialogue Tech. And we were talking about coming to Kubernetes and the overhaul the massive taking it would uh, to get to that level and to be working for this organization uh, uh, to have that already out was a tremendous learning experience for myself. Um, so and continuous improvements, another one too. Um, that's one of the main company values, but highly incorporated for uh, security engineering, particularly as we shift left. We're always shifting left, right? Um... Right. Yeah. That was a funny way to end that. So that, that's awesome. Uh, so let's, so what's, what's the stack look like at a high level? What, how many clusters are you running? How do you, how do you carve them up? Um, and, you know, without, you know, going into crazy detail, like, you know, what, what kind of size are we working with and what, what is Invoca? Like, I, you know, how, how do you even use Kubernetes? Um, I know the answer to that and it's kind of unique, but uh, we'd love to share kind of what Invoca does and why you need a compute infrastructure like Kubernetes to deliver your product. I see. Do you feel like feeling that one, or I mean, I, I could go next if you like. Oh, uh, well, uh, to describe um, our environment, um, we have eight clusters, um, but you know, we are constantly um, looking to upgrade and also this shifts quite a bit so getting pinpointed on exact numbers but with kubernetes we have massive work uh workloads uh, spread across different availability zones thankfully we're in a uh, fully cloud environment um and our stack is pretty unique to be able to serve um 
to transcribe calls to provide conversa conversation intelligence for marketing agencies to understand what it is a customer is looking for when talking to different um, uh, customer service representatives to understand that customer journey from start to finish is really in focus goal. And Kubernetes allows us to be highly available, um, allows us to scale ramp rapidly, be highly elastic so we can scale down things when things aren't as ramping crazy like Black Friday. Uh, but it really helps us um, really finely tune what resources are available to help out with that customer journey and provide that big data platform to understand what people are looking for in services. Awesome. Yeah, one other thing to add to that. Um, so we said we have eight clusters. We have about 350 nodes running in our busiest cluster at a time. And um, just to give you like a scale. So uh, Matt, also you mentioned about like how Invoca does conversational intelligence and we help our you know clients understand their conversations with their consumers to give them better marketing insights. So you mentioned that um, just to give you a scale, I'm just, I'm looking at like the, I'm trying to dig up like the, how many phone numbers, but I'm pretty sure we are using um, about a million phone numbers at a given moment. And so like, just to understand that scale of, of telephony, um, having this really reliable architecture is like Matt uh, said, is super important to Invoca. Yeah, that's, um. so by the, the sound of it, you're, there are phone calls flowing through these systems, right? So performance is ridiculously important, right? Because, you know, latency um, and, and extra hops throughout the network obviously are going to cause issues when you're dealing with somebody in the middle of a phone call. Um, and then the transcription services, it sounds like, you know, this is, this is, potentially sensitive stuff, right? Which leads me to kind of my next uh my next question. And we will we will come back to I IAC and, and and AppSec and how the security team thinks about that. But are you are you worried about compliance? Like do you have uh you know any sort of regulations around around this sort of system? Um I, I think again I know the answer to that, but and how does Kubernetes kind of help her indifferent as as part of that uh that kind of challenge that you have because you two are at the face of uh a face of that right like making sure you're in compliance and i'm sure there's a few uh customer security questionnaires thrown your way and it'd be interesting to hear how how kubernetes has impacted that journey as well yeah well we have uh two really rock star compliance analysts and so we're all very confident about the state of our compliance. Um, but yeah, like you mentioned before, we have so many phone calls pouring in and uh, we are under, if you can think of like any compliance regulatory uh, standard, we're under it and we're complying with it. And um one of the things that one of the interesting aspects of um kubernetes is that it's a little bit like we discussed before it's a little bit of a new technology in the sense that uh auditors aren't always aware of how kubernetes works and part of our jobs as the security team is to explain to them that some of the issues that they have with regular uh cloud with with regular servers, physical ser servers really don't apply to the cloud. There's a whole new set of problems that apply to the cloud, but not the same set of problems that apply to uh, physical infrastructure. So we explained uh, Kubernetes and how that works to our auditors years ago, but now we're still dealing with third-party um, risk questionnaires where, you know, before a client before a customer signs on with us, their security team will send us a list of like 600 questions about our environment and maybe like 
50 of them are or 100 of them to talk about you know like our our servers and you know like maybe like the heat of the server room or like questions that are totally totally um don't apply to us as it as it is now so some of that difficulty is going on um calls with our customers security teams and explain to them this is what kubernetes this is how it works and this is why these set this set of issues don't apply to us yes i filled out uh, a few of those questionnaires back uh back in the day and there's it's pure pain most of the time so i feel you uh uh matt anything to to add to that are you uh are you experiencing a, you know, a similar sentiment? Are you uh, like, what are you working on in particular when it comes to kind of Kubernetes security? Are you working with the compliance team? Absolutely. Yeah. And uh, just to echo what Essie said, I think a lot of the questions that we field coming our way from these questionnaires, but also auditors and a lot of the compliance frameworks haven't kept up to date with uh, the technology that's uh, you know, that cutting edge and Kubernetes is not really considered, in my opinion, uh, extremely cutting edge anymore. It's as more compliance uh, questions and more frameworks are updated, uh, companies are preparing to uh, have better answers and not have to explain from start to finish as it used to be, but there's still going to be some. So uh, the compliance questions that come our way, we always have to rely on some kind of uh, checkbox or uh, description box, you know, fully explain, you know, what ephemeral is and how hosts, you know, kind of go away as an example. But, um, you know, I think from that perspective, it actually makes a lot of auditors happy because we can use tools like KSOC example or different um, open source tools to help beef our security up and have Kubernetes uh, secure by default. And having to explain that to an auditor um, automatically crosses off a lot of their requirements off the bat, making them have less work, making us have less work. So that's just another benefit of using Kubernetes at uh, Invoca. Cool. It's also you, you, uh, uh, go ahead. Sorry, go. Uh, another thing that you just made me think of is it's super easy um, to like just show our auditors like okay this is our kubernetes clusters and this is our staging cluster our production cluster etc and here are the pods and just like uh gathering that info for audit time is a breeze and our compliant our compliance auditors love it we love it it's really seamless nice I've, i usually don't hear it's a breeze and compliance in the same sentence so yeah. um yeah that's awesome so uh, real, real quickly, SD, on uh, I know you're kind of uh, on the AppSec side of the house. You spend a lot of time building AppSec pipelines. Uh, uh, you're kind of ingrained with the CI/CD process. So what is has Kubernetes? I mean, it might just be par for the course at Invoca, which I, it sounds like it is. But like it, what is the power of of infrastructure as code and declarative infrastructure given and brought to your AppSec program? Has it has it helped in any way? And, and, and specifically, like down that shift left path as we're all going, are you seeing benefits from this type of infrastructure in AppSec? Yeah, so one of the really great things about infrastructure as code is, as the name says, it's code, right? It's all, it's static. Um, and because it's static, we can essentially run scans earlier on. And it's the idea is that we have it all in one place. We have all of these, the um, server like cloud knowledge in one place, and then it's much easier to audit it. Um, in the future, we're looking to prevent it's we're looking we're trying to be much more on like the preventative side where while developers are writing code they're getting suggestions this is uh potentially insecure do it this way instead um and like the idea is again much tighter feedback loops for our developers to get those vulnerabilities um or those 
access control misconfigurations early on instead of later on uh, in production. So yeah. the idea is trying obviously to move faster, shift left, um, easy auditing, scanning much more regularly through the CICD. Um, I, sometimes uh, network scans can take a really long time. And the ability to have infrastructure as code means that not only can you do dynamic analysis, you can also do static analysis on like the definitions, Kubernetes definitions. Yeah, exactly. And everything checked in to Git should be the reality of what's running, which is, uh, you know, down, down, down the GitOps kind of road that we'll get into a little later, because I think that's part of, of the future of all this. Um, so security inside of Kubernetes, right? You're running eight clusters, you're, you know, thousands of workloads, um, high availability, your, you know, critical traffic, uh, you, you know, these, these clusters get in a bad state, you're, you stop making money, one would, one would guess. Uh, so what, what do you do for security, right? Like we know this is a customer spotlight for KSOC. So um, how do you view security inside of Kubernetes? What layers matter? And um, how are you kind of handling that at a high level today? Absolutely. Uh, well, some of the presentations you've uh, given actually have been kind of pretty helpful in guiding us in how to approach security, looking at the OS top 10. We look at things that are um, particularly problematic for Kubernetes, uh, thinking off the top of my head, like our back is a big issue. We uh, always look to audit our users and how they can access it. And uh it's always a bit of a challenge to approach how to provision people based on their roles and what they can and can't do in Kubernetes. Um, but also things like network segment segmentation, we just talked about compliance. Uh, how do you explain to an auditor what our DMZ and what our production network is and how do you control that through Kubernetes and show that through there? Um, that's always been a bit of a challenge, but um, with tools such as KSOC and um, a lot of the scanning that we've done to uncover specifically vulnerabilities, but also like understanding our RBAC and stuff through the tool has helped us uh, identify our holes. Um, so there's there's many different areas I think we can go down and talking about Kubernetes security, but primarily I think I would highly recommend anybody who hasn't seen it already on this uh, pod or the webcast to check out your OS top 10. Uh, it's a great list to approach, you know, any cluster to uh, patch any holes or anything like that. You might uh, want to reference something like that to um, review your security. There's, yeah, uh, I can also speak to the, a little bit of like the journey of our Kubernetes security at um, Invoca, which is we have one thing that we, we have a, a multi-layered approach, obviously. And some of like, like in, in terms of when we, and we're specifically talking about scanning, right? So we have a runtime error that tells us like every single command that was uh, yep. ran in cluster. So that's kind of like a big hammer approach in the sense of if there's like an incident that happens um, and like we need a place to look for, it's, it's always a good source, but it's not really actionable um, just because if you, Remember before we discussed, we have eight clusters and we have about 350 nodes running at, on our busiest cluster at a given time. So um, it's just so much noise, it's not actionable. Um, we have uh, a few scanners that are running on a regular basis, uh, a weekly basis actually, um, that just scans our, our infrastructure to see if there's any issues. One problem that I specifically have with this scanner is that it is extremely it it some of one of some of the one of the problems that I have with the scanner is that some of the information that it's giving us is a little bit outdated. And let me explain. So sometimes we'll put uh, we'll put the scanner on. We we run it weekly, and we'll get like an error that. Um, it wasn't able to like scan a certain pod and 
And that is like a PCI compliance, like red flag. But meanwhile, this pod is ephemeral. So like pods like destroy and recreate all the time. And that's totally normal behavior. So it seems like some of the widely used scanners haven't totally caught on to all the intricacies of scanning the cloud yet. Um, and now, as Matt discussed, uh, we have another layer, which is KSOC, which we're extremely excited about. That's a good point, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, so we have two, um, thank you for that. Uh, we have two questions in chat. So I'm uh, gonna take a quick detour and, and read those. Uh, I'll start with, with Nick's question. Uh, is KSOC intended for just RBAC auditing or is it also used to monitor logging associated to pods and deployments? So um, uh, I guess that's a good chance for the the quick 30 second pitch. It is not just for our back auditing. So um, we have a, a, a really comprehensive rules engine that relies on event streaming from the Kubernetes API to discover misconfigurations uh, in line with any workload in the cluster, uh, including our back. And we track that uh, through the life cycle of a given entity in the cluster. We also offer um, SBOM generation, uh, image scanning in relation to all of those different workloads inside of the cluster, uh, as well as, as least privileged recommendations uh, for our back. Uh, we are uh, soon to be introducing um, audit log analysis capabilities as well. So discovering anomalies, who's doing what inside of the cluster, tracking their sessions. Um, so that that's coming in uh, our next release. So it is yeah, more than our back auditing. I think we we lean on our back a little bit because it's probably the messiest, uh, most underserved part of Kubernetes security, uh, as we've discovered. Um, so hopefully that answers your question, Nick. And uh, the second question, which is a really good one, uh, is you mentioned that Kate's in 2016 was the tool of choice, um, and. In 2016, it was that tool because it allowed devs to own more of the infra supporting their app than historically possible. So the question is, would you still choose Kubernetes today, or would you consider other potential paradigms if you were starting from scratch? Uh, that's, a, that's a good question. So I'll leave it to, to you two to uh, give your brief thoughts on um, if you were starting you know, from from scratch, same kind of problem statement, right? As Invoca is facing, like, is Kubernetes still the right choice? Uh, I'll just start with saying, uh, Raj, absolutely, one hundred percent. Um, gone are the days where networking, uh, sysadmins, uh, your database. Uh, all the heads are in one meeting and you have to mock up a request for them to be able to provide something for you. Now, now you can grab your own YAML, understand what it is you're running, uh, customize your own applications and be able to deploy within minutes or seconds. It's, it's absolutely phenomenal. I highly recommend any organization to take on Kubernetes. Uh, it's been, I can testify for uh, the, engineering department here at Invoca. And uh, I'd like to echo, I think they would also agree with me in that Kubernetes has been tremendously, uh, a, a tremendous help and been a fantastic infrastructure as code uh, serving Invoca. So um, I will only continue to look at a lot of different Kubernetes, um, you know, there's Helm charts, there's other things out there that can help you uh, deploy different tools and understand it better. But um, I would definitely 100% recommend that for other organizations to use. Are you being paid by the CNCF to say that? <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just kidding. Um, no, good answer. Uh, yeah, go ahead, SD. I think something really cool uh, that we've started to experiment with is this, it's called Backstage where an employee or an engineer can just like uh, spin up a service in a matter of like a few clicks and a few minutes. Um, and for me, like this is really, really exciting because this means that the ability to like create and innovate is 
so easy now. It's so easy. It's like, you don't need a networking team. You don't need a server team. Uh, 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 sorry, you don't need an infrastructure, uh, a team to like create the infrastructure for you. Um, and I'm sure like there are, it really depends on each use case um, and what this particular use case for the, the problem that you have. But I just see so much potential. I see so many benefits that we already have at Invoca with Kubernetes. And I also see a world of potential for where it can go. So I would highly recommend unless you have some other limiting circumstances. Yeah, that that's a uh, th those were both awesome answers, and I'm I'm actually going to take the opportunity to answer as well because at KSOC we have our own infrastructure, right? And we were born in 2021, so we actually had the opportunity. Although it would probably not be smart if we didn't build our own stuff on top of Kubernetes, but we had the opportunity to choose other technologies, right? Serverless, um, what have you, or just virtual machines, and we chose Kubernetes intentionally uh because it's, it's similar reasons right i think we we needed elasticity we have uh are able to hide like early days of kubernetes was a little challenging because hiring that that level of expertise just didn't really exist and it's getting better um and i think the features baked into the kubernetes project proper have kind of abstracted away the need for every developer to be a Kubernetes expert, right? Tools like Backstage are a great example, um, or even just you know these these more modern uh, GitOps tool chains, Flux and, and Argo CD that are really trying to get the developers out of the weeds of like you know configuring the nitty gritty YAML and just shipping software continuously. So I think what we're going to see is a, is another ten years ahead of us where Kubernetes still powers infrastructure but it you know it keeps kind of uh getting abstracted right like the, the the platform as a service starts to emerge where you don't have to understand the details of what's going on under the hood and you could just build and ship software right so um that's a good question though right like i i've only met one company ever that was born in the last three years that has intentionally chose to use serverless 100 and they have not launched yet and i'm curious to see if they actually will be on serverless for the forever right um so i don't think it offers quite the same level of consistency and uh just kind of pure compute you know consistency and power that kubernetes offers but that's just me um all right so let's uh let's wrap things up with, you know, kind of the crystal ball, right? So what do you think, what do you think security looks like in the next, uh, you know, two to three years within the Kubernetes ecosystem? And, uh, you know, are, what are we doing to adapt and change? And I'll uh, pass it over to SD first. Okay, a few predictions. <laughs> My first prediction is that we're going to see more uh, self-healing technologies. I know, I think um, KSOC does a little bit of this. And when I say self-healing, I mean not actually self-healing. Um, meaning, let me just step back. I mean, suggest self-healing suggestions versus actually self-healing because there's a little bit of a problem with self-healing architecture, which uh, Jimmy Mesta can probably speak on. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> we want the code uh, in the GitHub repository to be the same code at runtime. Um, another thing that I think is dealing with, again, I really um, highly applaud our two amazing auditors. Uh, compliant, sorry, I, I highly applaud our compliance analysts because they do most of the work, but I think that in two, three, four years, we're not going to have to have these discussions with, with auditors or customers because they're going to understand the technology well enough on their own. It's going to be industry knowledge. And instead, we're going to have different discussions with our auditors slash customers about 
which of the known security um, issues with Kubernetes are we taking care of, et cetera. Um, and yeah, again, it all boils down to much more awareness and tighter feed feedback loops for engineers um, of the vulnerabilities in their infrastructure. Yeah, I mean, less noise, more action, right? So that's kind of a, the the hardest part of being a security engineer today. Um, one of the hardest parts is is sifting through noise, right? Like finding finding a problem, acting on it, and you know, with confidence, uh, squashing some sort of of vulnerability or misconfiguration. Um, so I, yeah, I agree. Like self healing is. Uh, uh, yeah, it's part of the it's it's a little buzzword bingo esque, but there is something to be said about letting letting the, your security tool chain give you context and provide some path to remediation, right? Uh, whether that's in the form of of actual code to help a developer you know ship the thing they need to ship, or if it's actually changing the runtime state, which is probably a different webinar topic altogether, but. Um, yeah, no, that's a, a good prediction. What about you, Matt? Yeah, I agree with a lot of those predictions. I think specifically for uh, Kubernetes security, I think uh, you're going to see things like people moving away from secrets and using DIC. Uh, they're going to be using less persistent volumes. So some of the, I think, technologies that are used now or um, some of the things, components that make Kubernetes today will change for the better, um, be more specific, more tuned to build platforms better. Uh, like somebody said that Kubernetes was a platform to build platforms. So I think the, uh, will the building of different platforms will be greater tuned and easier for developers to be able to ship that code out. So, um, again, I think, uh, the security realm is, always going to be impossible to predict, but I can see the technology is changing and policies changing because of that, um, based upon what comes out in the news and stuff. So, uh, tools like KSAC are going to be instrumental in helping with that for sure. Awesome. Well, thank you for those answers. Uh, my prediction is that we will all be demoted to YAML engineers and AI will take over the rest of the <laughs> orchestration platform. So, um, no, I mean, I, I agree. I think, uh, I already stated my piece on abstractions. So yeah, happy to surf full time while the AI, uh, overlords take over our Kubernetes orchestration. So, um, cool. Well, with all that being said, um, I think we'll, you know, thank you so much, uh, for jumping on and, uh, and sharing your knowledge. I think Invoca has a really interesting use case in history with the cloud in general that a lot of companies um, can learn from. So we appreciate everyone uh, for attending. And, uh, you know, I think we've we've answered all the questions in chat. So if there aren't anything, uh, if there's anything else, then we'll just leave it with that. And you can always find us uh, at ksoc.com uh, or log in the LinkedIn and there's usually things flying around if you want to follow me there. Uh, uh, always interesting stuff going on in the, the Kubernetes security space. So appreciate you all for being here and uh, we'll be in touch. Cheers. Thanks.